Good morning. In this video, I'm going to describe how a uh, linear motor works, the kind that I use on the shaker table, and also show you at least roughly how the electronics uh, is made, designed for that shaker table. And um, I'll provide as much uh, reference information as I can the parts that I used, some stuff from Amazon that might be useful. Um, also, there's a microprocessor involved, which I really like because that allows you to control easily the, the rate of bumping of the shaker table and the amplitude of the force that's applied. Uh, that's a little more complicated, and I'll leave um, most of that for a separate video, I think. I'll try to go through this slowly and carefully so that you get the gist of stuff. It's not simple, but I think um, pretty much anybody can, can do this. So the principle is, let's draw it um, in this direction. So I'm going to shake things back and forth this way. If I put a magnet here, this is the way I have built the linear motor for the shaker table. So here north is up and here south is up. So I have a lot of flux B field that comes out of here and goes around like that. So let's say that the B field goes around like that. B stands for the magnetic field. If I put a coil of wire here, so I'm going to represent the wire as um, like this. So there's wire and it's carrying a current and I'm going to make all that current come out of the page here on this side and over here I'm going to make all the current go into the page and the way we represent that is with an X. So it's going in over here and coming out over here and we represent that usually with a dot in the center. I've made it too small really to see very well. Okay, so in physics we have um, Lorentz's law which is that the force from a current in a magnetic field is equal to the charge times the velocity crossed with the magnetic field and here the velocity and the magnetic field are vectors. So a simple way to think about that, I hope you can see what I'm doing with my hand, is we use something called the right hand rule. We go, here's the velocity, it gets crossed into the uh, magnetic field, that's V cross B, so V this way, that's the current crossed into the magnetic field, the magnetic field here in my example in the hand is up, and that provides a force in that direction. So if I apply that whole bunch of stuff that I just said to this problem, I end up, I'll let you work it out, I end up with a force that way or a force that way, depending on the sign of the current. So this might be current plus and that might be current minus. So I could shake the coil back and forth or I could leave the coil stationary and then this would shake back and forth. I've redrawn it to make it uh, clearer. Sorry, that first drawing was a little bit um, sketchy. So this is that same cross-sectional view that I just uh, described. We have the, the B field, the magnetic field comes out and goes back in. We have current going around in this direction in a coil. And um, we produce a force that goes back and forth this way due to the Lorentz force. So Lorentz force is basically the current. It ha it's a vector, so it has a magnitude and a direction. And the magnetic field, which is B, which is also a vector, it has a, you know, a direction and, a, and an amplitude. Um, so if I take that B field, 
So, so the way that this works is the right hand rule. The B field in the coil, the B field is going this way. I then turn my fingers in the direction of the current, which is um, out here, and I get a force that way. I also get the same force in the same direction from the current going in because there's the B field, but I've got to curl my fingers down in the direction of the current. So that's very awkward for me to do, but you get a force also in the same direction. So when the current's flowing this way, I'm going to get a force that way. If I change the sign of the current, I get a force that way. And this is the top view representation of that same thing. There's the two magnets stuck on a mild steel plate. We need that to return the flux. So we don't want the flux to have a long path to go. So the flux comes, you know, back in through this and goes like that. Um, and it's as simple as that. We make a coil. There's a core in the coil which is non-magnetic. It could be magnetic and you'd get more force, but if you put a magnetic core in there, the, these very strong magnets will pull on the core and it's uh, a disaster. So for this application, don't use a magnetic core. And then we just wrap wire around the core. And uh, if you look at my previous videos, you'll see the, you know, that, uh, this arrangement built. To drive this, we need to be able to force current in one direction and then to be able to force current to go in the other direction. We generally don't have a what's called a bipolar power supply. We only have a power supply, say 12 volts, which has a ground and a plus. So I need to have some kind of circuitry that switches the current in the two different directions that I want it to flow. That's why we purchase or we make, we used to make these, but now we can buy them. They're very handy. It's called an H-bridge switch. And the way it works is you put the motor coil across here. These are switches. They're typically CMOS, big, beefy CMOS devices now, so they'll handle um, loads of current. For instance, the one that I have handles 40 amps, and they're relatively inexpensive. And the way it works is we turn this switch on at the same time we turn this switch on, and then the current flows through the motor in that direction. However, if I um, change the orientation, how do I say that? If I open these two switches and close these two, then the current would flow in the other direction. And it's just that simple. And so in the shaker table, this happens about six times a second. You know, it goes bump, 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 bump. So the, the force is going back and forth at uh, six hertz. And it's due to those switches opening and closing in pairs like that. So that's an H-bridge switch. We get fancy with these things. Since these are CMOS devices, we can actually put a little more circuitry on here and also make it a, a PWM, which stands for pulse width modulation. We always call that PWM, and people will usually know what you mean by PWM. So pulse width modulation is, is I don't have to turn these on continuously. I can actually turn them on and off and on and off very fast, like at, say, 10,000 times a second. Typically, we would do that. So this motor isn't getting the full current going through here. It's only getting some fraction of it because I'm only turning the switch on uh, for, say, um, 10 microseconds or 100 microseconds at a time. And then I turn it off and I turn it back on. And I can control 
the amount that I do that, and that will change the force that's applied to this motor because I don't have the full current through it. So this is a really handy device. It's both an H-bridge switch and it's a pulse, pulse width modulation controller for my motor. So I typically don't have um, anything more than say 12 volts that I want to work with. 12 is a really nice number because then you can plug it into your car battery or you can take these little batteries that you can, you know, uh, feel in the field and so forth. So we'd love, we'd love to start with 12 volt, 12 volts. So this could be a battery. This could be a power supply that you plug into um, your electrical outlet or whatever. And then we boost it up to a higher voltage. In my case, I like 18 or 24 volts because I want to drive the motor to its full potential. This thing won't overheat even if I've got 24 volts on it and 100% current going through it. So I'd love to be able to get it up to that much power if I really want to drive the motor hard. So that's why I use what's called a voltage uh, boost converter. And um, I'll put up a uh, Amazon link to a boost converter that will work for this. Then I have the H-bridge switch, which I just described. Um, the output, which is, this is really the output from here to here, is the output of this thing. And that's, you know, here and here. It goes to the motor coil. And then we have some control lines. So, uh, and what I used is a microprocessor. And that microprocessor can have a built-in display and you can have potentiometers and the micro reads the potentiometers and then controls this so that um, we get the frequency and the amplitude of the shaking that we want. So it's a really nice way of having a lot of control over the shaker table. So we know we have to have a microprocessor to control this. You could control this probably with a bunch of other logic and uh, timer circuits like the 555 timer and so forth, and that would work. But I like the micro because you have a display and you can um, change the code and change the operation of the machine very easily. So we add a microprocessor. I like um, the micros called uh, ESP32. They're now becoming super popular. They're about 10 years old and they come with displays. So here's a beautiful little unit. The, the uh, microprocessor is actually on the other side of this board sandwiched between the display and uh, the PC board. Um, it's a complete total unit, costs about $20, and um, it's a little miracle. Anyway, it's got pins. You solder the pins to maybe a PC board or a vector board. I'll get into that maybe in a later video. And then you have the control lines coming in and out, and you wire it up to 5 volts and it just goes with the code. So that is what I use here. What do we have here? Well, the micro has the code in it that's switching these control lines on and off that uh, change the PWM and the current direction in the H-bridge switch. To run this micro, we need a 5 volt power supply. It actually internally runs off of 3.3 volts, but the board has a linear regulator that takes it from 5 volts to 3.3 volts. So what do we do? Well, we use what's called a buck converter. And that's just another circuit. You stick in 12 volts and out comes um, 5 volts like magic. And it's really easy to use. There's, of course, there's always a ground connection. And so that's how we power the micro. And the micro can be set up. This particular microprocessor has two analog um, inputs for A to D converter, those guys. So this is an analog signal generated from a potentiometer, which controls, say, the frequency. 
And so as you dial it up, you can, the micro will read it and know that it has to output a higher frequency or a lower frequency. And the same with the uh, force or the amplitude. And I usually make this in uh, percent. Percent of full. And full would be the full 24 volts whacking on this motor. So that's the whole story. We have to build a little uh, PC board that this will sit on, that this will sit on the edge bridge switch, the buck converter, um, the boost converter. So that, 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 and that are necessary to get onto a little um, electronics assembly. And I'll talk about that um, probably in another video. Uh, the last thing to talk about is the pump. So the shaker table needs a pump. And what I do is I just add another PWM. This is more gar garden variety PWM controller. And it just takes in 12 volts and it puts out a voltage that goes to the pump. The pumps all run off, these bilge pumps, they run off of 12 volts. Pump. Sorry. And uh, so this PWM will just control the amount of current that's going into the pump. And um, so you can have more or less water flow. And that's, of course, super important for a shaker table. So I also put this on the same board with this stuff, typically. And that's the whole story.